The anus is the final three to four centimeters of the gastrointestinal tract, and it extends from the rectum to the anal margin. The top and bottom of the anal canal are surrounded by the internal and external anal sphincters, which are two muscular rings that control defecation. The internal sphincter is under involuntary control, while the external sphincter is under voluntary control. Within the anal canal, there are mucosal membrane infoldings that form the anal columns. And at the base of these columns, there's the dentate or pectinate line, which divides the upper two thirds and lower third of the anal canal. Above the dentate line, the mucosa is lined by simple columnar epithelium, and below the dentate line, there's the anoderm, which has no hair and no sebaceous and sweat glands, and is lined by squamous epithelium. Now, hemorrhoids are normal vascular structures in the anal canal that act as cushions for the stool as it passes through. Hemorrhoidal disease is when hemorrhoids get swollen or inflamed, but the term hemorrhoid is often used to refer to the disease. Hemorrhoids are often caused by chronically or recurrently increased abdominal pressure from a variety of causes. For example, straining during bowel movements, chronic diarrhea or constipation, obesity, pregnancy, and old age. Internal hemorrhoids are ones above the dentate line, and external hemorrhoids are ones below the dentate line. Internal hemorrhoids are subclassified into four grades based on the degree of prolapse from the anal canal. Grade 1 hemorrhoids don't protrude outside the anal canal. Grade 2 hemorrhoids protrude outside the anus during bowel movement, but they retract spontaneously. Grade 3 are prolapsed hemorrhoids that don't retract spontaneously, but they can be pushed back in manually. Finally, grade 4 hemorrhoids are prolapsed hemorrhoids that cannot be manually pushed back in. Internal hemorrhoids usually don't cause symptoms, but sometimes they get inflamed, causing itching and painless passage of bright red blood with a bowel movement. On the other hand, external hemorrhoids are innervated somatically, and they're typically painful, especially when associated with thrombosed hemorrhoids, which have no blood flow due to a blood clot in the vein and swelling in the affected area. A diagnosis is usually made based on a visual and digital exam of the anus. However, the internal hemorrhoids grade 1 and 2 lie inside the rectum, so they can't be seen or felt, and confirmation requires anoscopy, which involves the insertion of a hollow tube-shaped device with a light attached at one end. Internal hemorrhoids look like bulging purplish-blue veins, and prolapsed internal hemorrhoids appear dark pink, glistening, and are sometimes tender masses at the anal margin. Thrombosed external hemorrhoids are tender and have a purplish hue. Further testing with flexible sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy is recommended if signs and symptoms suggest another digestive system disease and in individuals older than 40 years with symptoms of colorectal cancer, like weight loss and change in bowel habit, meaning a change in frequency, consistency, or caliber of the stools. The initial conservative management for symptomatic hemorrhoids is usually home-based by increasing fiber intake and drinking more water. Individuals may also take medications like oral or local NSAIDs like acetaminophen, ibuprofen, or naproxen to treat pain, as well as topical agents containing anesthetics like lidocaine for pain, or a hydrocortisone cream to reduce local swelling. In addition, individuals may also take sitz baths, which are warm, shallow baths that cleanse the perineum to help relieve irritation, pruritus, and anal sphincter spasms. Individuals with thrombosed hemorrhoids may also apply ointments containing antispasmodic agents like nitroglycerin, a nitric oxide donor, to reduce painful sphincter spasms. Finally, individuals that have bleeding associated with their hemorrhoids may get venoactive agents or phlebotonics to increase venous tone of hemorrhoidal tissues and reduce bleeding. Individuals with symptomatic internal hemorrhoids that don't improve with conservative treatment may need a simple office space procedure like rubber band ligation, sclerotherapy, or infrared cauterization for coagulation. Rubber band ligation is commonly used for individuals with grade 2 or 3 internal hemorrhoids. Elastic bands are applied onto an internal hemorrhoid at least 5 mm above the dentate line to cut off its blood supply while avoiding any somatically innervated tissue. Within a week, the hemorrhoid tissue becomes necrotic and simply falls off. Sclerotherapy may be done in case of grade 1 or 2 hemorrhoids, and it involves the injection of a sclerosant agent, like phenol, into the hemorrhoid. The sclerosant agent causes an intense inflammatory reaction, destroying the vein walls and making the hemorrhoid collapse and shrivel up. Finally, there's infrared cauterization, which is commonly used for grades 1 or 2 internal hemorrhoids, and it's usually only used for when other methods fail. 
It involves applying infrared light waves onto hemorrhoidal tissues, making a tiny burn to remove tissue and painlessly seal the end of the hemorrhoid. Within a week, the hemorrhoids generally dry up, shrink, and fall off. Now, for hemorrhoids that don't improve with home-based and office-based procedures, and for internal grade 4 hemorrhoids or severely symptomatic external hemorrhoids, surgery may be needed. An external hemorrhoidectomy is done by making an elliptical incision in the skin overlying the hemorrhoid. The incision goes around the hemorrhoid and is carefully separated from the anal sphincter to avoid injury. An internal hemorrhoidectomy can be done in a few different ways. In a conventional hemorrhoidectomy, the hemorrhoid is carefully excised from the superficial internal and external sphincter muscles. Stapled hemorrhoidopexy is an alternative to conventional internal hemorrhoidectomy. It involves the removal of much of the abnormally enlarged hemorrhoidal tissue, followed by a repositioning of the remaining hemorrhoidal tissue back to its normal anatomical position. The device also interrupts part of the hemorrhoidal blood supply, thereby decreasing vascularity. A final alternative is Doppler-guided transanal hemorrhoidal artery ligation, which uses a specially designed proctoscope housing a Doppler transducer to identify each hemorrhoidal arterial blood supply, which is subsequently ligated. In addition, increased dietary fiber of up to 25 grams for a female and 38 grams for a male with fruits, vegetables, and grains, as well as staying hydrated by drinking about 2 liters of fluids per day, can help reduce postoperative constipation and pain with defecation. Moving on, an anal fissure is a tear to the anoderm, which contains many sensory receptors. So anal fissures cause anal pain and bleeding that often accompany bowel movements. The pain can be so severe that it can lead to avoidance of toileting, which leads to fecal impaction and constipation. As the stool remains in the gastrointestinal tract, more fluid gets reabsorbed, leaving the stool hard. Passage of the hard stool can cause anal trauma and make the fissure worse. An anal fissure can also cause exposure of the internal sphincter muscle, leading to muscle spasms, which can worsen the pain, restrict blood flow to the fissure, and prevent healing of the fissure. Some fissures are acute, lasting less than 8 weeks, whereas others become chronic, lasting for more than 8 weeks. Chronic fissures typically show an exposed white edge of the internal anal sphincter muscle at the base of the fissure. Oftentimes, chronic fissures are accompanied by external skin tags. At the distal end of the fissure, the tag is called the sentinel pile, and at the proximal end of the fissure, the tag is called the hypertrophied anal papillae. A primary fissure is one that results from anal trauma, for example, from constipation. Other causes include the use of rectal thermometers, enemas, an endoscope, an ultrasound probe, from a vaginal delivery, and anal intercourse. Most of the time, anal fissures are located in the posterior midline of the anal canal, and less often they can be in the anterior midline. Sometimes, there are fissures in both the anterior and posterior midline, and these are called kissing fissures. Anal fissures in a lateral location are atypical and more commonly due to a secondary cause, like Crohn's disease, sarcoidosis, an infection such as HIV or syphilis, and anal cancer. The diagnosis of an anal fissure is confirmed with inspection and gentle digital palpation of the anal verge causing anal pain. Individuals with rectal bleeding or an atypical location of the fissure should get further evaluation, including anoscopy, colonoscopy, or sigmoidoscopy, to exclude secondary causes of an anal fissure or an alternative diagnosis like hemorrhoids. Treatment for anal fissures involves a combination of a stool softener like oral docusate sodium, sitz baths, a topical analgesic like lidocaine, and a topical vasodilator ointment like nifedipine or nitroglycerin for one month. Individuals with persistent symptoms are given another month of the same treatment. After that, individuals who still have persistent symptoms are sent for an endoscopy to evaluate for a secondary cause. If there's no evidence of another cause, the individual may need surgical treatment, like a botulinum toxin type A injection or a lateral internal sphincterotomy in which the internal sphincter is divided to lower its resting pressure, which helps improve blood supply to the fissure and allows faster healing. Individuals who aren't surgical candidates are treated with the alternate topical vasodilator, so nitroglycerin ointment if they were initially treated with nifedipine ointment, and vice versa, or one of the second-line agents like topical diltiazem, topical bethanacol, oral nifedipine, or oral diltiazem. Finally, there's anal cancer, which is rare. 
Risk factors include human papillomavirus, or HPV infection, especially the strains 16 and 18, HIV infection, having multiple sexual partners, receptive anal intercourse, and cigarette smoking. Symptoms include anal or rectal pain, itching, bleeding, discharge, a palpable lump around the anus, and a change in bowel habits like frequency, consistency, or in caliber of the stools. The lesion is confirmed with inspection and digital palpation if it's higher in the canal. After this, anoscopy can be used to get a biopsy. Anal cancers are usually squamous cell carcinomas, but can also be adenocarcinomas. Endoanal or endorectal ultrasound is useful to evaluate the size of the tumor and see if it infiltrates the external or internal sphincters. Anal cancers can be spread by blood and by lymphatic drainage. Tumors above the dentate line spread lymphatically to the mesorectal and internal iliac nodes, whereas tumors below the dentate line spread lymphatically to the superficial and deep inguinal nodes. Staging requires palpation of the groin to assess for lymph node involvement, a CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and a PET CT scan to look for distant metastases. Stage 1 and 2 tumors are the ones that haven't spread to lymph nodes or organs, with stage 1 being smaller than 2 cm and stage 2 being larger than 2 cm. Stage 3 is a tumor of any size that has spread to lymph nodes or invaded nearby organs. Finally, stage 4 is a tumor of any size with distant metastases, usually to the liver and lungs. Treatment for anal cancer from squamous cell carcinoma includes combined chemoradiotherapy rather than surgery because it can cure many individuals while preserving continence. The most common chemotherapy regimen is a combination of the drugs mitomycin C and fluorouracil. Local excision is an option for tumors that are smaller than 1 cm and without lymph node or metastatic involvement. Otherwise, surgical therapy with abdominal perineal resection is reserved for individuals who have recurrent or persistent disease after chemoradiotherapy. That's where the anal rectum is removed, along with both the internal and external anal sphincters, leading to fecal incontinence and requiring the need for a permanent colostomy. Treatment of anal cancer from adenocarcinoma includes initial abdominal perineal resection rather than initial chemoradiotherapy. Finally, adenocarcinomas arising in the anal canal are managed like rectal cancer. For stage 0 and 1, a surgical resection of the tumor is usually curative. For stage 2, a partial colectomy may be needed, along with adjuvant chemotherapy, which typically includes the full FOX regimen, which consists of folinic acid or leucoverin, 5-fluorouracil, and oxaliplatin, or the full FURY regimen that consists of folinic acid, 5-fluorouracil, and arenotecan. For stage 3, surgical resection including the nearby lymph nodes and adjuvant chemotherapy is recommended. For stage 4, a surgical resection may be done to remove the tumor and metastasis in the liver or lung, but if surgery is not an option, then chemotherapy is the main treatment. Alright, as a quick recap. External hemorrhoids are usually painful, whereas internal hemorrhoids typically cause itching and painless bleeding. Visual and digital examination may be enough to diagnose external or internal prolapsed hemorrhoids, while internal hemorrhoids grades 1 and 2 may require anoscopy. Further testing with flexible sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy is recommended if signs and symptoms suggest another disease, such as weight loss and change in bowel habit. The initial treatment approach is home-based, with a high-fiber diet and staying hydrated, as well as oral or topical NSAIDs, topical agents containing anesthetics like lidocaine, or a hydrocortisone cream. In addition, individuals may also take sitz baths to help relieve irritation, pruritus, and anal sphincter spasms. Individuals with thrombosed hemorrhoids may also apply ointments containing antispasmodic agents like nitroglycerin. Finally, individuals that have bleeding associated with their hemorrhoids may get venoactive agents. Refractory internal hemorrhoids may get office-based procedures like rubber band ligation, sclerotherapy, and infrared cauterization. A final option for refractory hemorrhoids, internal grade 4 hemorrhoids, and severely symptomatic external hemorrhoids is surgery. An anal fissure is a tear to the anoderm that causes anal pain and bleeding with each bowel movement. Diagnosis involves inspection and reproducing the anal pain with digital palpation. Individuals with rectal bleeding or lateral location of the fissure should get further evaluation, including anoscopy, colonoscopy, or sigmoidoscopy to exclude secondary causes like Crohn's disease, sarcoidosis, an infection such as HIV or syphilis, and anal cancer, or an alternative diagnosis like hemorrhoids. 
initial treatment involves a stool softener like oral docusate sodium, sitz baths, a topical analgesic like lidocaine, plus one of the topical vasodilators, nifedipine or nitroglycerin for one month, and that's repeated for another month for persistent cases. Refractory cases can be treated with botulinum toxin type A injection, a lateral internal sphincterotomy, or the alternative topical vasodilator. Finally, anal cancer can cause bleeding, pain, itching, anal discharge, a palpable lump around the anus, and a change in bowel habits. Anoscopy can be used to get a biopsy. Staging is done by checking for lymph node involvement, as well as CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and a PET CT scan to check for distant metastases. Stage 1 and 2 tumors have not spread to the lymph nodes or other parts of the body, with stage 1 being no larger than 2 cm and stage 2 being larger than 2 cm. Stage 3 is a tumor of any size that has spread to lymph nodes or invaded nearby organs. Finally, stage 4 is a tumor of any size with distant metastases. For treatment of squamous cell carcinoma, combined chemoradiotherapy is the preferred method, while abdominal perineal resection is reserved for recurrent or persistent disease. Whereas for adenocarcinoma, abdominal perineal resection is usually done initially.